with all the things that have been different so far today, we are kind of entering into now a continuation of where we've been in the last several Sundays. We've been working through uh, at different times through the book of Genesis, and specifically over the last several weeks, working through uh, the unit in Genesis of chapters 25 through 36. And so please turn your Bibles to Genesis 30, and, and specifically verse 25. It is fitting that we came outside this week for our service, because this week, as we continue to study through this narrative of the life of Jacob, his story is moving outdoors as well, uh, out into the fields. Last week, Jacob became the father of a number of children. And this week, Jacob is going to become the owner of a great number of animals. And Jacob is also going to get out from under the servitude of his father-in-law, Laban, but not without some struggle. Of course, by now we know that not much of anything happens in this portion of the book of Genesis without some sort of struggle or without some sort of wrestling. But Jacob's work is going to result in growth, both in himself and in the amount of his possessions. And the reason that Jacob is going to grow, the reason he's going to be blessed, the reason he's going to return home safely, it's because God has promised it. That is why. In Genesis 28, verses 13 through 15, God promised this to Jacob. God said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Uh, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done, until I have done what I promised you. And in this promise, God passed to Jacob uh, the covenant he had given to Jacob's father, grandfather, Abraham. Uh, Genesis 12, God said this to Abraham. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land I will show you. And I will make you, I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in the midst of all this struggle, why is this family growing? Why are the forefathers of a nation being birthed? Why is Jacob going to increase and have a great name in the region? And why has the Lord become the God of Jacob? Why will we see Jacob growing in his faith today? Because God said he would. What God has said he's going to do, he is going to do. God has chosen to pour out his grace on this man and, and his grandfather and his father and many from among this people who came from them, as he continues to pour out his grace on people like you and me today, all we who have put our faith and trust in him alone through the shed blood of Christ alone. And nothing can separate us from the gracious love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now with that big picture of the grace of God in mind, now we jump back into the struggle. And we're picking up where we left off last week, Genesis chapter 30 and verse 25. And we are going to cover quite a bit of text today. Uh, sometimes the genre of biblical narrative can be a little tougher to preach through just because of the narrative, the nature of narrative, uh, of historical, true historical story. And so much of this message today is going to be simply us reading through this account. Uh, so you can follow along if you like or just listen as we work our way through this part of God's big story in the Bible. Uh, so Genesis chapter 30, verse 25. Just before I start reading, can everybody all the way back to the swing set here okay? We're good? Okay, let's carry on. Chapter 30, verse 25. As soon as Rachel had born Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, Send me away that I may go to my home uh, and country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go, for you know the service that I have given to you. Uh, Jacob has finished his service for Laban. Remember the bride price of 14 years for both Leah and Rachel, and now he's ready to go home. 
Uh, this does mean that all 12 of the children that we've seen born so far were born within this time period of seven years. Remember, Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, got Leah, agreed to work another seven years for Rachel, and married her within a week of being joined together with uh, Leah. And then add Vilha and Zilpah. And that, and that wasn't right, by the way. Uh, you can go back and listen to last week's message for more on that. Uh, but seven years go by, and there are 12 children between the ages of seven and newborn baby, baby Joseph. And we also see in these verses, Jacob knows who he's talking to. And he emphasizes to Laban, these are my wives, my children. I have served you. The price is paid. Now let me go. And we'll see later that Laban has other ideas. Uh, but Laban said to him, Laban says, verse 27, If I have found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages and I'll give it. Now first, if Laban actually used pagan divination to learn this about Jacob, it would be a lot like in 1 Samuel 28 where Saul went to the witch at Endor to bring back Samuel. And then remember, God took over uh, that seance there. And, and God took over in, in that meeting and let him have a visit. And we don't really get any more of an answer than that concerning this whole divination thing. But it does remind us here of Laban's pagan worship. Laban is a polytheist. He worships many gods, false gods. And he worships them because he wants to be prosperous and wealthy. And he hopes they'll help him. Uh, hence his desire to keep Jacob around. Laban wants the blessing that Jacob has. And if his God is a part of that package, then that's cool too. But that's not the way that God works, is it? Uh, people don't use gods to get their way. But God does use people to bring about his will. And really anything else he wants to use to bring about his will. And Laban is using flattery here. He says to Jacob, if I have found favor in your sight... He's making a promise as well that he'll never intend to keep, asking him to name his wages. And Laban is being a trickster again, and Jacob knows it. Verse 29, Jacob said to him, You yourself know how I've served you, how your livestock has fared with me. You had little before I came, and it's increased abundantly over and over. And the Lord has blessed you wherever I turned. But now when, when shall I provide for my own household also? He said, what shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this for me, I will again pasture your flock and keep it. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep, every black lamb, uh, the spotted and speckled among the goats, and they shall be my wages. Don't give me anything, but these will be my wages. And so he says in verse 33, my honesty, and remember this is Jacob speaking, Though his word is about to become more and more sure here, but Jacob said, My honesty will answer for me later. When you come to look into my uh, wages with you, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and black among the lambs that found with me shall be counted stolen. And Laban said, Good! That ought to be a warning to us if Laban said, Good. Let it be to you, let it be as you've said. Uh, but that day, that very day, Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted, and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, everyone that had white on it, and every lamb that was black, and put them in charge of his sons. And he set a distance of three days' journey between himself and Jacob, and Jacob pastored the rest of Laban's flocks. So as soon as Laban agreed to give Jacob these speckled and spotted sheep, every black lamb that spotted and speckled among the goats, Laban removed them all from the flock and took them three days' journey away and left Jacob to take care of the rest. That wasn't the deal. Right from the start, Laban's trying to minimize what Jacob could receive. And on top of that, back then, the normal shepherd's wage would have been at least 10% of the flock and a percentage of the wool and the milk from the flock. Jacob is asking for less than that. A sheep are normally white. Goats are normally dark, one color. 
what Jacob would have asked for here would have been amounting to less than 10% of the flock. So, of course, Laban jumps on this. But then he also removes all of those animals that would have gone to Jacob and leaves Jacob to shepherd the rest. And if you can remember back to science class, those genes that would have produced those speckled, spotted sheep and, uh, sheep and goats and those black sheep, most of those recessive genes just left with Laban and his sons. The animals Jacob is now shepherding were going to have even less uh, likely chance to produce those characteristics in their offspring. So from man's perspective, things might have looked pretty bleak. With all these circumstances, Jacob might say, how could I be blessed now? But remember, Jacob's a thinker too. And he put together a plan, a weird plan, a plan that wasn't actually effective, but a plan nonetheless. Jacob is going to try to do it his own way first. In the next several verses, we're told that Jacob would set out sticks. He would take sticks from trees, pull them apart, and lay them out next to the water where the animals drank. It was also where they would mate. And the prevailing thought at the time, like an old wives' tale back in the day, was that if animals saw something before they mated, their offspring could bear that trait. They see it, and then they procreate, and the appearance shows up on the, on the offspring. And so Jacob made these sticks look like stripes next to the water, thinking that that would cause them to have striped baby lambs and goats. That's not how it works. They're called recessive genes, Jacob. But he kept doing it anyway, and he would only set those sticks up when the stronger, healthier animals were going to drink water. So he thought he was making all of his animals strong and healthy, and he thought that he was giving Laban all the, the uh, unhealthy, weak, puny ones. So Jacob is still acting like a trickster here, isn't he? Uh, the struggle continues. But who is actually causing this animal situation to turn in Jacob's favor. Even if, and even though Jacob is still being a trickster, God is doing this. God is, of course. Who is blessing Jacob, sometimes in spite of Jacob, and decidedly not blessing the one who's trying to curse Jacob? God is. That was his promise. God's covenant God is in control, whether we know it or like it or not. And Jacob later understands this. He'll say twice in the next chapter, God was with me. And Laban's boys, they're starting to notice this too. I'll go down to verse 1 of chapter 31. It says, Now uh, Jacob heard the sons of Laban, what they were saying. Uh, Jacob has taken all that was our father's, and from what our, was our father's, he gained all this wealth. And Jacob saw that Laban did not regard him with favor as before. And now that Jacob wasn't making Laban rich, and it looked like the transfer of wealth was heading the opposite direction, Laban was no longer a fan. It says in verse 3, Then, not a moment too early, not a moment too late, then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. Jacob now gets his call. Uh, much like the call of his grandpa Abraham that he received to go to the promised land, God says again, I will be with you. And so, verse 4, Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was. In order he did this to have a secret meeting out of range of any of Laban's house. And he said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. You know that I have served your father with all my strength. Yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. Uh, this is since the agreement was made. Ten times. Then he says this very important statement. But God did not permit him to harm me. You're getting it, Jacob. If Laban said, the spotted shall be your wages, and all the flocks bore spotted. And if he said, the striped shall be your wages, and all the flock bore striped. Thus, in this way, God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. So the agreement from up in chapter 30 has been altered ten times. And still Jacob's flocks are growing and Laban's 
are increasing. Notice too, Jacob was putting out stripes of six, and they were bearing spotted animals. So he knew at this point, my thing is not working. God is doing this. It didn't matter what man tried to do. God's will could not be broken. If God is for Jacob in this way, who can be against him? If God is for us, who can be against us? Jacob is learning this. And God reminded him of it specifically. Jacob recounts this to Leah and Rachel in verse 10. In the breeding season of the flock, I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream that the goats with, uh, they made with the flock where they were striped, spotted, mottled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all the goats that made uh, the flock are striped, spotted, and mottled for. I have seen the God who sees. I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar and made a vow to me. Now arise, go out from this land and return to the land of your kindred. And you remember Jacob's if-then vow? Back in chapter 28, after the almighty sovereign God told Jacob what he was assuredly going to do, Jacob said, if, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I may come again to my father's house in peace. If God does all these things, then the Lord shall be my God. And now God is calling him on it. You vowed. It's time. Jacob, I told you I would bless you and bring you back safely. You are blessed, and I am taking you back safely. I will be your God. God has decreed this, and God is seeing this through. Who is in the driver's seat here in this relationship between God and Jacob or any of us? God is. That is really good news. Now let's see how Rachel and Leah respond to this. Uh, will they be willing to leave their father behind? In verse 14, then Leah and Rachel answered and said to him, is there any portion or inheritance left to us in our father's house? Are we not regarded by him as foreigners? For he has sold us, and he has indeed devoured our money. All the wealth that God has taken away from our father belongs to us and to our children. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do. Uh, the sisters see Laban disregard and, and his trickery against Jacob. They see this as an effort to also take away from their own future security. Uh, the bride price was supposed to be kept uh, in case, in that time, it was to be kept in case the husband abandoned or in case he died. And Laban evidently squandered that as well. And his recent attempts at changing Jacob's wages are meant to keep Jacob poor, but it wasn't working because God. Rachel and Leah at this point are acknowledging God as a more faithful caretaker than their father. Good. And are therefore willing to obey this command. A good reminder for us, a good reminder for us that a right, true view of who God is will bring us to humility, to a desire for reconciliation. A right view of God will compel us to cry out for his grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. And a right view of God will stir up in us a desire to live our lives wholly for him. Uh, so now Jacob has his instruction from the Lord. And Rachel and Leah are in agreement and ready to go. Verse 17. So Jacob arose and set his sons and his wives on camels. He drove away all his livestock, all his property that he'd gained, the livestock in his possession that he'd acquired in Pat and Aram, to go to the land of Canaan to his father Isaac. Laban had gone uh, to shear his sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. And Jacob tricked Laban the Aramean by not telling him that he intended to flee. He fled all that he had had and arose and crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. And Laban is called here Laban the Aramean. Uh, here is a, it's kind of a literary technique here. We're being reminded that Laban is not part of of the plan of God's people in the promised land. Jacob is officially now detached from his house, from his oversight. And now Laban is just some other guy from some other family from some other country. 
even his daughters by by these words are counted as remember they said we are counted as foreigners in his eyes and part of Laban's distinction from Jacob remember the most important part is his paganism and we see uh, that here where Rachel steals these household gods it's interesting that in the Hebrew the exact wording for the beginning of verse 20 where it says in English Jacob tricked Laban in the Hebrew the exact wording is Jacob stole Laban's heart this was a figure of speech in Hebrew for being a trickster. And so in the exact wording, Jacob stole Laban's heart and Rachel stole his gods. And those household gods would have been kept and worshipped for the purpose of protection. They were also considered fertility gods. Uh, sometimes these gods would have served as a, a signifier to the right of inheritance, meaning whichever son got the household gods from dad, was going to in get the inheritance as well. And so it's possible that Rachel stole these little statues as a token of their taking away this wealth as an inheritance. Or Rachel stealing the gods might just mean that she hasn't put her own paganism away just yet. And she wanted more babies. She's already said that. And now when Laban finds out that Jacob and all his new house is left, he wasn't too happy about it. And he puts together this posse and took off after him. Uh, the, next, the text in the next few verses uses words like pursued, overtook, pitched their tents. These are descriptions we'd find elsewhere in Scripture in the accounts of battles, warfare. Uh, so Laban may have had some ill intentions at tracking down Jacob, but in verse 24, God intervened. Look at verse 24. It says, But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful not to say anything to Jacob, good or bad. This warning from God meant one of two things. Either God was telling Laban, do not try to speak any blessings or cursings on this man, because he's mine. Or, or uh, God is telling Laban, don't you dare try to get him to come back, either through a lucrative offer, good, or through threatenings, bad. I tend to favor that option. Uh, if God, I think God is telling Laban, Jacob and all that is with him, they're leaving. And there's nothing you can do about it. Let them go. Uh, but J Laban was still ticked. Laban was still angry, and he, he still had a thing or two to say to Jacob anyway. In verse 26, Laban says this. Uh, Laban said to Jacob, What have you done that you've tricked me and driven away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and trick me and did not tell me? so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs, with tambourine and lyre. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, that's what Laban would have done, right? And he says, why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? And now you've done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm. Well, hold on there, Laban. He says, but the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful not to say anything to Jacob either good or bad. And now you've gone away because you longed greatly for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? I understand, he says, why you wanted to leave. I get that you wanted to go back home, but why didn't you let me know? And why did you steal my gods? You took away my possessions. You took away my right to a fitting farewell. You took away my protection. Or what Laban thought was his protection. Laban knew that Jacob's God was the source of his blessing, but he still preferred his own designer gods. And so Laban just asked Jacob, why? And verse 31 gives the answer. Jacob answered and said to Laban, because I was afraid. For I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. Anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. That's not a very fearful thing to say. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I've, that, your, that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Interesting that Jacob, under the sovereign hand of God, was afraid of his own well-being, his own well-being, but was willing to throw anyone else under the bus if they had these gods. Keep that in mind for the weeks ahead. Maybe when we meet Esau. Now in the next several verses, though, Jacob... Uh, Laban, I'm sorry, Laban looks around feverishly for his household false gods, and he eventually comes to Rachel's tent. 
And if they'd been playing that hot, cold, or hotter, colder game, when, when Laban went into Leah's tent, they might have been saying, colder, colder, freezing cold. And then Laban walks over to Rachel's tent, getting warmer, warmer, red hot. But Rachel had hidden those small statuettes made by the hands of men in her saddle for the camel, which tells you how small they were. And she sat on that saddle like she was sitting on a box and told her dad that it was her time uh, of her monthly cycle, even though it wasn't. And the reason Rachel's trickery worked, it's not because Ra Laban knew not to mess with Rachel during that time. The reason why is because the people of that time would have considered it a great disrespect, a great defilement of those gods to sit on them in that condition. And so Laban didn't think for a second that Rachel would dare sit on those false gods if she was on her cycle. And so he moved right along. He moved right along and he never found them. Look down to verse 36. And then Jacob became angry and berated Laban. And Jacob said to Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you've hotly pursued me? For you have felt through all my goods. What, what have you found of all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between us two. Uh, Jacob has just made court be in session. Produce the little false god statues. Let's see who's guilty of an offense. Or now Jacob goes on the offense. Laban is the one to be prosecuted now. Verse 38, these 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goats have not miscarried. I have not eaten the rams of your flock. What was torn by a wild beast I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it myself. From my hand you required it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Jacob is turning into a man of integrity, isn't he? There I was by day, the heat consumed me, the cold by night, my sleep fled from my eyes. These 20 years I've been in your house. I served you 14 years for your two daughters. That's, that's Jacob saying, you tricked me. <laughs> and then six more years for your flock, and you've changed my wages 10 times. And now here's where we see that Jacob really is starting to understand what's going on. Verse 42, he says, If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac, capital F, the fear of Isaac is the Lord. God is the fear of Isaac. So Jacob's saying, if God had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands, and he rebuked you last night. Court was in session. Jacob accuses Laban of attempted robbery. And we can say attempted robbery because Laban failed. And why did Laban fail? Because Jacob had God on his side. This should be a moment of celebration, right? But now look what Laban does. Verse 43. Laban answered and said to Jacob, These daughters are my daughters. They're my daughters. The children are my children. The flocks are my flocks. All that you see is mine. But what can I do this day for these my daughters and for their children whom they've born? He says, Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. In Laban's words, in Laban's eyes, he is making himself out to be an incredibly generous individual right now. Jacob has just said, I am blessed today because God has blessed me and protected me from you, Laban. And Laban is saying, all of this is mine. And I guess I'll give it to you now. So aren't I so generous? If Laban can't swindle Jacob out of all the blessing, he's going to have to settle for trying to swindle God out of being the giver of the blessing. You see? In Laban's eyes, Jacob has earned nothing through his 20 years of labor. And God has given Jacob nothing. Laban wants to be the giver of every good gift. This is actually really sad. Laban is spiritually dead and spiritually blind. He's therefore consumed with himself, his own desires, his own urges, his own feelings, and his own glory. 
But after speaking the truth to Laban, Jacob must remember that God has commanded him to leave. And even though Laban doesn't get it, if Laban is settled to part ways peaceably, Jacob just needs to leave as it is and go. And so verse 45, Jacob does this. He takes a stone, he sets it up as a pillar. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. And they took stones and made a heap and they, they ate there by the heap. And Laban called it uh, Jegar Sahadutha. Whew. But Jacob called it Galid. Thank you, Jacob. Both of these names mean the same thing, by the way. It means a witness pile. A witness, seeing it. Laban uses the language of the Arameans. Jacob uses what would become Hebrew. Verse 48, Laban said, This heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore he named it Galid and Mitzpah, which means watch post. So a witness and a watch. For he said, The Lord watch between you and me when we are out of one another's sight. And some people mistake these verses to be like a lovely farewell. And they put it on jewelry and, and greeting cards and stuff like that. But look at the next verse. If you oppress my daughters, <laughs> or if you take wives besides my daughters, although no one is with us, see, God is witness between you and me. So instead of Laban writing a Hallmark card, what he's really saying is, if I could, I wouldn't let you out of my sight. I can't trust you one bit. So may God watch you on my behalf so you don't do anything stupid. Thanks, father-in-law. That's what he's saying to him. Uh, verse 51, Then Laban said to Jacob, See this heap, this pillar, which I have set between you and me. This heap is a witness. The pillar is a witness that I will not pass over this heap to you, and you will not pass over this heap and this pillar to me to do harm. The God of uh, Abraham, the God of Nahor, and that could be a little g there, because Nahor's God was not Jehovah God. And the God, or the God's little g of their father, judged between us. Remember, Abraham was the first in his family to follow the true God. And so Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. Laban by this plurality of false gods, Jacob by the one true God. And Jacob offered a sacrifice in the hill country and called his kinsmen to eat bread. They ate bread, they spent the night in the hill country, and early in the morning Laban arose, kissed his grandkids, his daughters, and blessed them, and Laban departed and returned home. As we finish up today, after seeing the growth of Jacob in the midst of all this chaos, we, we often look at the spiritual health, or even just the spiritual life, the salvation of a person we know and love, with the idea of wondering what all we could do, what we could do, or what we could have, or should have done, to see someone get saved, or to see someone grow or to keep them from making any sinful choices. And it can be good for us to think about how we can love someone more, or love someone better. God has called on us to love him and to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we certainly can grow in that. We always can. Uh, what we can't be is in control. And that's hard for us sometimes, isn't it? But let's be encouraged for a moment to think about this from God's perspective as well. Uh, Jacob had a dad who preferred his brother, Esau, because he was more into hunting, eating meat. That was why he liked him better. Jacob's mom tended to be a schemer and taught him her ways. And Jacob utilized those skills. Jacob himself was a trickster, a liar. And we see him being a trickster over and over again in these narratives. Laban, his father-in-law, has used and manipulated Jacob several times, including ways that resulted in Jacob having more than one wife. And Jacob's wives have not loved him as much as they've used him to try to overpower one another in rivalry against each other. And with all these struggles, with all these difficulties, with all these abuses, with all this sin that we see in the narrative of the life of Jacob, both of his own doing and that which was done against him, there was nothing and there was no one that could stop Jacob from being a recipient of God's sovereign grace. God was always in control. And God set his grace upon Jacob 
and there was no stopping him. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Christian, you are saved today because God set his sights on you in eternity and called you his own. And therefore, by God's will and by God's design, if you have put your faith in Christ for your salvation, and if you haven't, I would plead with you today to put your faith in Jesus Christ and Christ shed blood on the cross for your sin alone, for your salvation. And if you have done that, you have become a follower of Jesus Christ. By God's will and God's design, your identity is now rooted in Christ Jesus alone. God sees you in and through his righteousness. And there is nothing anyone could do to change that, including you. Praise God. Christians, your neighbors, your co-workers, your extended families, your friends, even your children... For all you know, they might be your brother or sister in Christ in no time. They may take that next step of growth and sanctification if they already know Christ in no time. And perhaps God has chosen you to be the one to share the gospel with them, to pray for them, to encourage them, to speak the truth in love to them, to plant the seed, to water it, or maybe even to reap the harvest. And if they hear the truth of the gospel and believe, if they hear your loving encouragement or even uh, an encouragement in the form of rebuke, and they respond in faith and obedience and repentance, then praise God. And if they don't, and it causes a little friction, or maybe even a lot of friction, know that there is nothing that could stop you from being a recipient of God's grace. And God can use good relationships and not so good relationships. God can use things that look like just happenstance events. God can use speckled, spotted, and striped sheep and goats to conform you into the image of his Son. And if we do this and if we follow Christ in this way, we will also know that we've been obedient to our God. You will always know that you tried to point those you love, those you know, to their only hope of rescue. And if God's going to save them, it'll only be a matter of time. Maybe not the time we would like, but only a matter of time. And then, eternity. Jacob was afraid of Laban, but he also knew the fear of Isaac. Capital F, fear. May the fear of Isaac be ours as well, as it became Jacob's. And praise God for his glorious grace. Praise God that that glorious grace brought our salvation, that it will bring about our sanctification, and will ultimately bring about our glorification. Nothing could separate Jacob from the love of God, and nothing can separate us, church from that same love through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these wonderful truths from Scripture. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for using every detail of our lives to point us to yourself, to love us, to shape us and conform us, to sanctify us in Christ's likeness. And God, we praise you and thank you for this grace and plead for it knowing, Lord, that our, gro our growth is a gift. We ask you for more, knowing that this request is a greater glorification of you, a worship of you, an honoring of you. So, God, we thank you for these things. And pray, Lord, that we would live in this truth and in this comfort, this rest, this security in the week ahead. And we pray all of these things in Christ's name. 
Amen.